Have you ever met a person that you heard that they had achieved something and you're thinking to yourself, that would be so cool, but there's no way that I could do that. Um, and it's almost like, like we know our limitations for most of us. Uh, we kind of know our limitation. We know what we're definitely good at, but we also know what we're not so good at. Or maybe you've seen a movie, uh, read a book, and uh, you're like, that would be so great but there's just absolutely no way that I could do it. Um, even spiritually speaking, I mean, like we can read a passage in the Bible and we read it and we're like, I agree with it. It's so good, but it just doesn't seem like I can do something like that. And I wanna show you, I kinda wanna put the problem in the room and I wanna show you a, a scripture verse that taking out of its context, really makes it very difficult to attain it. This is where it's found. It's in Colossians 3, verse 17. It says, and whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him, through Jesus. And like, I totally 100% agree with this. Totally agree with this statement to do whatever uh, do everything, word or deed, as if I'm doing it for the Lord. I agree, but at the same time, I think, how? Like, how do I do something like that? And, and, and I don't even know where to start. It feels overwhelming. I want to tell you about my father-in-law. My father-in-law, his name is Dick Crawley, and this is Dick. Um, he is quite possibly the greatest person I have ever, ever met. And that, I, and I really am saying that I'm not trying to score points uh, uh, with his daughter, but, but I truly believe he is that kind of guy. Like he's a man's man. Like he is the type of guy, they live in Iowa and uh, they just got about 20 or so inches of snow and he's in Iowa and he's plowing and shoveling the sidewalks in his driveway. Um, during the heat of the summer, he is out there mowing the grass. He's also up underneath a car. He's on top of a roof. He's always doing something. He is a man's man. He's also extremely kind to, to a fault. And if you're ever in a hurry and you go to the store with Dick, uh, you know you're going to be there for a while because he has never met a stranger. He will go up to some random person and say, I think I know you. And they try to figure out how they know each other. Um, he's extremely generous. He is uh, Barnabas in the Bible. Uh, he's such an encourager. And I remember like when I first started coming around and getting to know this girl named Nicole, and this was her father, and I was extremely like insecure, because I thought to myself, this is such a, a, a man's man, and, and not just a man's man, and not just kind, but he like overflows Jesus everywhere he goes. And I was so intimidated because I thought there's no way that I can be him. And I remember the first couple years of my marriage with Nicole, I would think to myself, she wants me more, want, she wants me to be more like her dad, and there's no way I can measure up to that. Today, we're gonna be talking about this idea of a life of worship. A life of worship. And, and again, that's one of those things where it's like, yeah, I that that's great, but what does that even mean? Like, how does that even work? A life of of worship. It sounds like a tough task. It sounds like something that I don't know if I can do. And what does any of this mean? And I think it's important to know, and from the very beginning of this series, we've been talking about what worship is, and we gave a definition of worship. This is what it is, a treasury of God above all things that overflows into external acts of glorification. Now, for most of us, uh, we think of worship as like a 20 to 25 minute, like part of a Sunday morning service. Um, for some teenagers, some of us, we think it's a Sunday morning service, but it's also our Sunday night gathering where we have uh, about 15 or 20 or so minutes of worshiping together. And, and so we think of worship in that way, which it is clearly that is a musical form of worship, but worship is much more than just singing songs. But 
we relate to worship or know the term worship by what happens in a church. But true worship is about a life that treasures Jesus above all things. That's a life of worship. It's treasuring of Jesus above all things. We're gonna be hanging out in the book of Colossians and just a little bit of what's going on and who wrote it. I think it's important to talk about those things to kind of relate to where we're at. Colossians was written by a guy named the Apostle Paul who wrote like two thirds of the New Testament. And, And he wrote to a group of Christians living in a city called Colossae that was really struggling with some foundational beliefs of who Jesus is. They're being taught some wrong doctrine. And so Paul wrote this letter to these Christians to kind of help them along in their faith. Now, chapter one and two is really laying the foundation of who Jesus is, as well as once you've crossed that line of faith that you are made alive in Christ. And then chapter three is we're gonna be hanging out in. And just kind of to set it up, this is where we're going. The first thing is set your minds above. So the first part of Colossians 3 is set your minds above. This is is what it says. It says, if then you've been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on the things that are above, not on the things that are on the earth. For you have died and your life is hidden uh, your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also will appear with him in glory. From the beginning, Paul sets the tone and he says, if then you have been raised with Christ. Now, a lot of us, uh, we've kind of been around church um, or or we hear phrases similar to this, that you've been raised with Christ and and we're not too sure what that means. We agree with it or it sounds good, but we don't know necessarily what it means. Being raised with Christ really means this new identity that the old has gone, the new has come. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17, the old has gone, the new has come come. You're a new creation. It's almost like a new mindset that you have been raised with Christ. And because we've been raised with Christ, we are, we are to seek things that are above, to not no longer be um, stuck on the things on the earth. I love the word seek because in this uh, verse one, seek here means to, to have a passion, a desire, a desire to, to, for the things that are above, a passion for the things that are above. Now, this kind of desire, this kind of passion can only happen when we treasure Jesus above all things. We treasure him above all things. Even in this world that we live in, there can be times where the foundations of what we believe in as a nation, as as a person can be shaken. And the world gives you some things, but Jesus gives you something far greater. The world, when when things, uh, when, when our foundation has been rocked, we can be, the world gives us like anxiety and Jesus can give you joy. Joy that even in the midst of something terrible, even in the midst of things happening that are out of our control, we have this unspeakable joy that, that is in us. Or, or sometimes we don't know how things are going to turn out and the world can give us some, some fear. But the Lord can give us peace, peace beyond all understanding. If we seek the things that are above and not in the world in front of us. Paul says, for you have died, for you have died, meaning it is no longer me that's living, but Christ living in me. Galatians 2.20, no longer it's me, but it's Christ within me. How exciting is this? Your past life is gone. You're no longer identified by that. You are identified by who he is and what he's done in you. That, That you have died. That's a past tense. Not only your old nature has died, but you're also hidden with Christ. You are hidden with Christ 
Our lives are about him, that we are called, that we are loved, that we are chosen. I love that, that we are chosen, that, that we are his beloved. But in this world, it can be really hard. Like it's one of those things where it's like, I really believe in that. Like that is so great, but I just don't know how I can live up to it. It doesn't really seem attainable. It's one of those far-fetched things. It's like, I believe in it. That would be great, but I just don't see it in my life. Wouldn't it be amazing if this is how we see ourselves, that we no longer see ourselves by our old sinful habits, our old sinful choices. We don't see ourselves by uh, uh, the, the things that we have done in, in the past or, or even then the, some of the things that we're currently still struggling with. Like we don't see ourselves in that way. We see how Christ sees us. He sees himself in us. This is the problem though, what happens when we see worship as only a chance during the first 20, 25 minutes of a service. That, or we think like the only way I can connect to God is through a certain song, saying a certain way at a certain time in a certain place. In our minds, like that's what we think worship is, but what would it look like if worship was much more deeper than just a song that we sing or just a portion of our service? When we are worshiping Jesus with our life, we begin to see that we are not who we were, but who we are called to be. We, are, we have died. We have been raised to new life that, that we will appear with him in glory. How beautiful is that? What would it look like if we began to see yourself as God's beloved? How would that reflect our worship toward him? So moving on, uh, it, it, we have to set our minds above, but we also have to put to death. We have to put to death. In verses five through nine, Paul says, put to death, therefore, what is earthly to you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. And these you too once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices. Paul begins this list by saying, put to death, put to death meaning deny yourself, deny those things that is a desire or what, what your fleshly desires want to deny yourself. It, it also means like no longer to pursue. I love this definition is, is uh, um, to consider them dead to consider them dead. Meaning like when you see something dead, you don't just come up to it. You're like, hey, that looks cool. Like you consider it dead, you, you stay away from it. So put to death these desires. What are some of these desires? It's this sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. These five deal with sexual sins or sins of the flesh. Paul is saying to put to death all of those things, no longer desire those things. Moreover, he, he continues and he says, also put away anger, wrath, malice, slander, obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another. All of these six have to deal with what we say or even how we respond. And I know here for some of us, like when we see anger here, we're like, ah, you know, is that really a sin? There is a thing called righteous anger, which is okay. The problem though with anger is when it's our first inclination, when something happens to us, that's when it can lead us down a path that doesn't honor God. That is not a righteous anger. These six, we often overlook though. I mean, let's be real. These are the, the types of things that we're like, you know what, it's, it's not terrible. Like in our minds, we have a hierarchy of what's good, what's okay, and what's like really bad. You know, if we look back here, we, we look at these things as like, these are really bad. These though, they're okay. Like, like you, you know, they're all right. They're, they're not great, but they're not terrible. And we have this hierarchy 
of sins or hierarchy of what is okay or not. But, but Paul says to put all away, to put them all away, to be real, open, and honest. I rage a bit. Like, I get angry sometimes over the smallest things, the silliest of things. I get so angry. Um, one time, it was a couple summers ago, I was outside and I was hanging outdoor light. And I got it all on there, put it all together. I was so proud of myself. Uh, in my mind, I was like, okay, it's gonna take 20 minutes. I'm coming up on that 20 minute mark. So there, everything's working out. And so I put the, the, the outdoor light like onto the wall or onto the outdoor, the, the outside of the house. That's really tough to say, but on the outside of the house. And so I put it up there and I grab the screw and the screwdriver and the screw keeps falling. And I pick it up and it keeps falling. I pick it up and keep, keeps falling and I'm getting so angry. I get so angry that I punched the brick wall. I mean, like, what is that gonna do? If anything, it made things so much worse because now my hand hurts and I still gotta find the screw. I'm so angry. I've been known to hit my truck because I've been angry. Like, it is not the correct response. I've also been known to yell. Uh, it was about 20 years ago or so. Uh, my wife and I were first kind of married. We had these close friends and we went camping with them. It was a great weekend. And on Sunday morning, we were packing up our stuff and getting ready to head out. And my wife had said, hey, make sure you roll up the sleeping bag, right? I need you to put this away. Make sure you put the cereal where it goes. And so I'm just frustrated because I'm thinking like, why is she telling me what to do? I know what to do. I'm a man. And so she, somebody had walked by the tent and I figured it was Nicole. And so I said, stop telling me what to do. I know what to do. Well, I ended up yelling at my best friend's wife. I mean, like just totally like raged over nothing that needed to be raged about. I think as a father, what's really, really hard is seeing how my kids pick up on that as well. Because one of my kids rages a bit. You see, these are things we often overlook, but they have huge consequences. Moving on, he says, you must put them all away. Each one of us has an old way of thinking, an old way of dealing with things, an old way of, of kind of a thought process, an old nature. And, and Paul is saying, put them all away. But honestly, this can be extremely hard. Again, this is one of those things, like I agree, totally agree. I need to put them all away. Like I should not lead with anger. I should not like say obscene things. I should not lie to people. I should not do these things. And I agree with it, but how? Wouldn't it be amazing if we treated others the way that we want to be treated? Wouldn't it be great if we saw people as image bearers of God and not as objects? Wouldn't it be great if we uh, said nice things constantly, that we lead with niceness, not assuming the worst of everyone? This can't happen, though, when worship is just only a piece of a Sunday morning service. Worship needs to be something that overflows us. When we begin to treasure the Lord in all ways, the things of this earth grow strangely dim. So for you, how different would you treat others around you if you started to treasure Christ more than anything else? That the words we read on the screen are a part of our everyday life. So if we're, if we're putting to death something, we need to put on something. And Paul says, put on love. Put on love. That's what he says in verses 12 through 17. He says, put on then as God's chosen ones. I love that, that we are his chosen ones. We're holy and we're beloved. How beautiful is that? Put on then uh, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you. So you also must forgive. He goes on and says, and above all these things, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. 
and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts to which indeed you were called in one body and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Is there anybody tired yet? Like for me, when I hear do this, don't do this. When I hear, you need to watch what you say, you need to put on love. To me, it just sometimes feels like a task. Sometimes it can even feel a little legalistic. Watch your mouth, you gotta do all. And so it kind of feels that way. And Paul's gonna kind of lean into some heavy areas. But before we get to that, catch what he says. He says, put on then uh, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. These five things re are revealed in relationships. I love this. A great measure of a life of worship is not only how we love God, but also how we love those around us. A great measure of a life of worship is not just how we love God, but also how we love others around us. When I look at these, the one that jumps out at the most for me personally is compassionate hearts. In this text, compassionate means mercy toward those in misery, to have mercy for those in misery, to care for, to tend to, to listen, to love, to let them know they're present, they're seen, in their herd, to have compassionate hearts. And Paul being the Paul that he, that he is in verse 13, he says, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. In this world, someone has, someone will, or maybe someone currently has offended you or done something that's hurtful or harmful to you. And for some of us, sometimes just the mention of their name, sometimes when we see a car drive by that they drive reminds us instantly of that pain, of that hurt, of that frustration, maybe even of that annoyance, of that, per it just instantly reminds you and takes you back to that moment. And Paul has the audacity to say, forgive each other as the Lord has forgiven you. But in Jesus's forgiveness for us, it is our responsibility to forgive others. Now, with that being said, there are some things that takes longer than just say, hey, I forgive them, no big deal, moving on. There are some, some forgiveness that takes much time, much work. That's much longer than just a whatever moving on. Or for some forgiveness takes months and even years. And in those types of, of moments and issues and struggles, it's wise to find somebody to pray with you and counsel you to start the, the beginning phases of forgiveness. Pastor Jason said something a while back ago, and I think it so applies, is that once I've understood how I've been forgiven, it becomes easier to forgive others around us. So we take off the old nature and we put on love. We put on love. Now this sounds great, doesn't it? Put on love, like I agree. How do I do that? How do I deny myself and put on love? How, how do I stop using the wrong language, stop lying, stop uh, having these fleshly desires and put on love? What does that look like? It feels and seems so unattainable. It's one of those sermons and one of these messages, one of these passages in the Bible that just doesn't seem like I can connect with it. And then moving on, it, it, verse 17, and whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. I agree, but it seems unattainable. 
seems as if I can't measure up. And so why should I even start? But Paul gives us some indications on how this happens. He, he gives us the, what does this look like? The first is, and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. The peace of Christ. Peace is the fruit of the spirit, meaning the Holy Spirit. It's not me that's doing it. And I, I can't will myself enough to, to do this. It's through the Holy Spirit. Isn't it interesting though, that if you're familiar with fruit of the Spirit, it's found in Galatians 5, that one of the fruit or one, one of the fruit of the Spirit is self-control. Wouldn't you imagine with all this, do this, don't do this, do this, don't do this, put, uh, put to death and put on love. Wouldn't you imagine like, and let the, the uh, self-control of Christ rule in your hearts. I was talking to my friend, Ryan, and um, Ryan had said something that was so profound for me and it made, help this make sense for me. He says, but there is a peace that happens when we let the Holy Spirit rule in our hearts. So Paul first says, let the peace of Christ. The second thing he says is let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Word of Christ is the gospel of Christ. It's the gospel of Jesus. Let that dwell in you richly that he left perfection for you. That he lived a perfect life, became the spotless lamb, so ultimately to die on the cross, to take our sins and give us his righteousness. How beautiful is that? This transaction that happened. That he died on the cross and three days later rose from the grave and 40 days later ascended up to heaven. That the, the gospel of Christ, let that dwell in you richly. Let that sit in you and you continue to go back to the gospel to continue to go back to the gospel again and again. So how do we live this out? Is peace rules in your heart and you dwell on the gospel inside you. It is no longer about doing things in your strength. It's all about Christ. Now there was a time that I really thought the gospel could only be explained through teachings, through messages, but God's the God of creativity. And he actually here, uh, Paul, he brings out that the word of Christ also through singing psalm and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. That he is a God that is a creative God. So the gospel can be explained through singing psalms, hymns and spiritual songs and giving thankfulness to God. When I think back when I was 18, 19 years old, all I ever wanted to do was teach the gospel. And so for me, it was such a struggle when I had to get a job and I worked at a grocery store cutting meat and cheese. I remember as I was slicing the meat and slicing the cheese, I was thinking, I don't wanna do this for the rest of my life. And that attitude kind of, overflow over <laughs> uh, went everywhere. Like it, it affected my relationships. It affected um, my work habits. And, and like I called in sick all the time. I really didn't really care about what I did or how good of a job I did. It affected everything. And even affected my relationship with my uh, future spouse. I remember one time when uh, my, my father-in-law now, but my girlfriend's dad asked me to come over and chop some wood uh, for their fireplace. And I'm a Chicago kid uh, and I didn't grow up around a wood burning stove or a wood burning fireplace. And so I was like, yeah, no big deal. So I went on over to his house and he showed me how to do it. And he's like, you know, I'd stay and help, but I actually have to get ready. And he worked the second shift, uh, he was a trucker. And so um, he went inside to get ready. And so I'm out there cutting wood. And I realized that I'm not made, like this body is not made for cutting wood. And I was just getting frustrated. Again, it kind of, that popped in my head that I don't want to do this, this kind of work for the rest of my life. And so it really affected how well of a job I was doing. 
And about 20 or 30 minutes goes by and eventually my father-in-law comes back out. He has his work boots on and like his jacket and stuff that he's wearing. And he's like, hey, just so you know, while I was in there, I was praying for you. And, and as I was putting on my work boots, um, God gave me a verse for you. And I don't have time to, I didn't have time to look at it. So I just want to give it to you. I got to head out to work. And I said, all right, Dick, I'll, I'll see you later. And so I'm out there for about another hour slicing wood, cutting wood. And I go inside his house and I grab a Bible. And this was the verse he gave me. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God through him. Do everything. Do everything. Dick li lives a life of worship and it affects everything that he does and affects every person he comes into contact with. Dick lives the life of worship. The reality is he has something that's attainable. He has the Holy Spirit living inside of him. And if you and myself, if we cross that line of faith, the Holy Spirit lives inside of us. And because of that, he does something that is attainable. He lives a life of worship. Every time he sends a letter or an email off to someone, he says, I'm being the man that God wants me to be, that he has for me to be. What a beautiful way to sign off that he wants to be more like Christ and less like himself. You see, when the truth hits our hearts, it leads us to a deeper level of treasuring Christ above all. So what about you? Do you treasure Christ above all things? Does it affect your life? Does it affect your work? Does it affect your relationships? Does it affect your family? Does it affect even your drive, does it affect everything that you do and everything you are? When you look at this list of put away, put on, stop doing this, or don't do this, do this, does, does it feel like you're just willing yourself there to do it? Or are you living a life of worship that isn't just a 20 minute segment of a Sunday morning. Guys, have a great week. And uh, we're gonna pass off to the campus pastors. See you later. Hey guys, thanks so much for hanging around just for a few more minutes. I have a question for you. What does it look like to live a life of worship? The last like year and a half or so, we've been really kind of talking about this rhythm of life called the bless rhythm. And this is what it is if you're new, uh, is it spells out bless. So B, begin in prayer. L, listen. E, eat. S, serve. And the last S is share. It's living this rhythm of life is a way that you can uh, live a worshipful life. Is B, begin with prayer. Begin your day with prayer. Asking the Lord, not for needs or things that you want, but more of like, like I want to join you today. L is listen. Listen to maybe where the Lord is leading you and guiding you as well as listening to those around you. Eating really has to do with relationships and connecting with people and meeting them where they're at. The first S is serve. So serving people around you as well as serving the Lord with him. And the last S is to share. Not just share your story, which is extremely important, but also being open and honest about the ebbs and flows of life, the wins, the losses. And, and so I just wanna pray with you and to try to help, even encourage myself to live a life of worship. God, thanks so much for this chance just to connect together, to hang out, uh, maybe, maybe laugh a bit. But God, I pray that we all begin to live a life of worship. And when people think of family church, when they think of uh, us who attend and us who are engaged, that they see something different about us. Not, not a community that is so uh, religious on what to do, what not to do, can't do this, do this, and become all about legalism. 
but a community that lives a life of worship, that realizes it's only through the Holy Spirit that we can do this and the gospel of you, Jesus, that we can do these things. So help us to begin that process of forgiving and loving and leading with that love to those around us. That worship is much more than a 20, 25 minute segment in church. That worship is about treasuring you above all things. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Really quick, I want to show you a quick video. Uh, It's our Join the Journey video. And one of our community uh, people, uh, Rochelle, wants to share her journey and her story with you. Guys, we'll see you later.